So I am going to talk to you very briefly about uh, the health and environmental impacts of natural gas infrastructure. For those of you who maybe are not aware, although I am pretty sure I'm preaching to the choir here. But um, I, um, I actually sure. downloaded the, most of these pictures that I'm going to show you, um, the, the few that I could bring up for my, um, for my presentation from, from the Frack Tractor Alliance. It's a really amazing uh, website with a lot of information, not only for people affected by na natural gas infrastructure. I'm the moderator for this, right? <laughs> 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 so you you have to check with the conference organizer to see if he approves. <laughs> That's me, right? Uh, yeah, I'm the conference. You need me to. Moderator was asking if, if, we, if somebody was going to. To record it, do we know or, or yeah. It's supposed to be recorded. Oh, okay, cool. Is it is it been recorded? We have no idea. I don't think so. No, I see Yeah. I see a light blinking. Okay, good, good. 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 No, so we, we were just wondering. But <laughs> I'll talk right into it then. Okay. Oh. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Oh, all right. Oh, good. All right. Well, so, wait, Maybe next you want to have to introduce it and start over? Or? Yeah, we do. Sure, right? We're recording. I'm too tired. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what about you? I didn't even get the vibe. I'm the end because I get the vibe. I need to get back to the house. Oh, okay. But you guys can go this way. Some minute vlogs are back to the house. Don't hold the class. Yeah. So Natural gas. She's going to sit up on it. Okay. So, uh, what time? Where are we on time? Seven minutes late? Okay. Well, we couldn't do much. So, uh, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, to our session, Natural Gas Impacts on Human Health, Cold Point Compressions uh, in Western German Community Voices. Um, so, so I'm the moderator for this session, and we have three guests, uh, three panelists, Kelly Kennevin, uh, President of Amp Preach Council, uh, Margaret Flowers, Pediatrician and Community Organizing Cold Point, and uh, Dr. Honor Rule, uh, Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Health. Today we're going to really talk about um, beyond the fracking ban and how natural gas is still a major issue. It's an issue for many communities uh, in, in the state of Maryland. And so we're going to start out with doing PowerPoint. So our first presenter is, is Dr. Honor Rule. And how long are you going to go for? So 15 minutes. What we're going to do is have each presenter present and then we'll have questions at the end. Okay. So Dr. Rowe. Thanks very much, Dr. Wilson. So, um, uh, so I'm going to talk about the health and environmental impacts of natural gas infrastructure. And by natural gas infrastructure, we're going to talk about the, the sort of the whole process that, that this uh, natural gas uh, commodity <laughs> uh, takes to come to the final, uh, I guess, consumer. So, so fracking, as we all know, is one part where it's extracted, but there's all of this other infrastructure to, to bring it and to, to uh, realize this, this, uh, this commodity. And so I have taken some photos from Fresh Tracker, and uh, you will see some of the photos that Fresh Tracker has there's a, a, a really a very a good a wealth of information on that website for every, anybody that can uh, that is interested in, in using. And so um, I'm gonna start. Um, uh, so so the problem with this natural gas infrastructure is that it's quickly spread, and it, as most of the technology unfortunately does takes uh, research and health professional by surprise almost. So by the time you turn around, it's pervasive, it's everywhere, and nobody exactly knows if it's good or bad, or it's probably not good, but it can be that bad. And so, so unfortunately, it, when, with money driving everything, we, it just there's, it doesn't seem to be a, a, 
a space for the government or for the, <coughs> for the regulators to, to slow things down. It just keeps going and then we have to play catch up. So um, unfortunately, more, most of the, these hazards have not been uh, evaluated. Uh, but fortunately for us, there's a lot of people uh, paying attention. So there's some direct hazards that just by the nature of the, of the process, we know are impacting the environment. And so there's this direct uh, hazard to, to water, to air, and to soil quality. And I have a few, few photos here from the Frack Tracker uh, website. And you can see, I don't know if, um, if I can do this. Um, but you can see here that this first slide that has like this bluish thing, it's, it's, a, it's a, a drill site in Harrison County, West Virginia, where the landowner reported seeing oily substance bubbling from the ground into the street. And so this, um, the driller was later cited, it was like, like we were commenting on our previous session, they were probably fine, they probably paid the fine and continued to work and go on as business, with business as usual. Uh, there's another uh, fire on a, on a well that, that it exploded. And of course, you can see the plumes all impacting air for sure. And there's the, the trucks and the, the, the rest of the, the uh, things that people don't, or I guess some people don't realize that it's not just about the pipes and the, and the wells and the fracking. It's also these, the trucks and the noise and the, and the silica. Um, so there's an environmental noise, exposure to toxic chemicals, and there's other secondary impacts. So the mental stress, the, the mental health stress, and stress that the communities are subjected to, uh, and the disruption on the social fabric. So, so here, this really local, small community. Uh, there's a lot of them in, in Pennsylvania, in Maryland, and then suddenly you have this boom and bust economy trucks and, and, and contractors and people coming in and out. And so uh, all of this affects the health, not only of the people, but, uh, not only of the environment, but also the people. So um, there's, a, there's a mechanism called the health impact assessment that I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And here at the University of Maryland, they actually took the lead to do the health impact assessment uh, in, in preparation for the, for the fracking ban. And so um, we in Maryland have been lucky to have some pushback from the community enough that the, that the government is paying attention. And so there was first this fracking moratorium, and they asked for, requested this study to, to assess the, the potential health impacts, as if common sense were enough. So because common sense means nothing to these people, you have to go through these <laughs> many, uh, exercises to do this. And so they went through this through first a scoping, uh, scoping uh, step where they went to the communities and got input from those communities and, and a lot of the stakeholders in the community. So they talked to, to uh, about increasing traffic, the litter, the crime that is increasing in these, in these parts, the environmental impacts, and the concerns about the changes, the changes in, in their community. Um, then they did a baseline assessment with just evaluating just like the, the health infrastructure based on the clinics and, and hospitals that these communities have here, would they be available or would they be able to support these potential health effects that people are going to, to be experiencing? Um, and then they went ahead and do the health impact assessment, which because there was no information in Maryland, you have to base on, some, on the, the effects that were already being uh, felt in other states that had already uh, gone ahead with the drilling. And so the focus uh, of the study were Allegheny County and Garrett County. That were, that the, those were the, the, the counties that were going to be most impacted by the actual fracking. Um, but I have to say at this point that even though the actual fracking is just a little part of this natural gas infrastructure, we feel that it affects similarly in all of its, um, throughout its uh, lifespan. I don't know, but so this hazard ranking methodology that they use for, for their health impact assessment is a very thorough and methodical um, uh, following some steps to try to leave no stone unturned. So you have some set of evaluation criteria, and you apply these criteria to every single one of those hazards that were first um, 
um, recognized through the scoping mechanism. So, air quality. First, identify the presence of vulnerable populations, such as children or individuals over 65 that would be affected uh, due to the air quality alone. The duration of the exposure, the frequency of the exposure, the likelihood of health effects due to this air quality. And then after you're done with these seven evaluation criteria for that first hazard, you move to the second hazard. And so you end up with a matrix with a really thorough understanding of what's the current state of the, of the health and impact and what's the potential. And so they, this is an example of one of the things that, uh, that, that is in the, in the final health impact assessment that the researchers actually published. And so, so this is one of those things that helped the community and also got out and, and, and is, is helping other communities around the country uh, by using this methodology. So they, um, for, uh, if there was a presence of vulnerable population, you assign a score of one. Um, if, if not, uh, if no, there's a score of one. If yes, a score of two. For the duration of exposure, they have three different um, scoring systems, one, two, or three, depending if it's less, like, less than one a month or, or, or more than a year, and so on and so forth. So each of those seven uh, evaluation criteria that I mentioned for each of the eight hazards have all of these things considered. And so you end up, and I'll show you um, it at the end. Um, so they ended up with this final sort of like very visual, easy to communicate um, summary for the community, for the stakeholders, for the government, for the decision makers. And there was no, it's in inequivocal. We found that the air quality, the likelihood, likelihood of negative public health impacts due to air quality was high, due to healthcare infrastructure was high. Uh, the healthcare infrastructure was going to be highly affected by this. Um, occupational people working in these places are highly affected. Uh, social determinants of health were high, highly negatively impacted. Um, this impact assessment, um, at the time that it was 2004, was was published. I mean, 14. <laughs> 14. Um, the the cumulative exposure risk, the evidence was only enough to, to say moderately high. The flowback and production water related also moderately high, and the noise moderately high. And I think we have more information in these four years after that that we could probably modify this, and, and uh, we should. So we were, we we're talking with, with people to try to uh, to incorporate risk uh, these uh, uh, health impact assessments at every single point in the decision making uh, process. So. Um, so these some of the uh, examples. We know that um, shale gas composition is predominantly methane. And um, last week, uh, a couple of us were uh, invited to the Maryland, I think we were invited, we kind of crashed it, but <laughs> <laughs> the Maryland Department of the Environment had a, uh, uh, um, the, the mitigation, mitigation working group uh, that were going to talk about greenhouse gas greenhouse gases, and, and uh, that was mostly their focus, greenhouse gases. And so they were not considering really other things except, oh, with this natural gas infrastructure, we are reducing CO2. And by reducing CO2, we're saving the planet. That was pretty much their pitch. And so we came in and said, OK, so you you are maybe reducing all your CO2, but have you considered that the amount of methane that you're going to be releasing into the air? And methane comes not only by itself, it comes with a lot of volatile organic compounds, and they are generally known for many years not to be good for health. Um, also, you can reduce CO2, but only the emissions are less than 3% methane, and we know that these are very leaky, very poorly controlled, um, systems and infrastructure, so some, some papers have uh, reported up to 17%. Uh, there's many other sources, like I've been talking about, like the, 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 the engines that power, the, 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 the wells, the trucks, the compressor, the drilling rig, all of these are powered by 
diesel or natural gas um, engines that release uh, contaminants into the air. Um, there was a study also in 2014 that predicted that by 2020, the Marcel shale activities would account for 12% of the total nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds into the, uh, into the atmosphere, and 14% of the total particulate matter. So these are rural regions. So these are, these are high impacts uh, that the communities are feeling. And there's really still to this day very little information and planning on, on air pollution because the, as Len is going to talk later, <laughs> the regulatory framework is not geared to address community uh, locally, um, uh, local sources. It's, it's more towards like a given, given a, uh, like an average of the state. So, um, so a little bit of, of what we know about air pollution, the, the few studies that are out there. Air samples that were collected less than half a mile of the well pads uh, were compared to uh, air samples collected more than half a mile. They did find, um, and, and I have some, some uh, very technical terminology here, but the median benzene concentrations were 2.6 versus 0.9. And the, to, to give you uh, an idea where the health-based standard for benzene is at 1.8. So, so this 2.6 is already uh, above the health-based uh, regulatory, it's not regulatory because it's not a max, but the, 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 the limit that EPA set for health effects. So um, the University of Washington also found VOCs, and some of those VOCs are benzene, hexane, and acetone, and all of those are hazardous air pollutants. Um, VOCs are known to have central nervous system effects, so they, in um, acute or very short term, uh, cause drowsiness, fatigue, headaches, but with constant, continuous exposure, you can have liver and kidney disease, and some of them, like benzene, are actually, uh, have been known to cause aplastic, anemia, leukemia, bone marrow abnormalities, and other not, not good health um, And that's not even counting the, the studies that we know that are not related to fracking or natural gas infrastructure. <coughs> For the last 50 years, we have been documenting health effects of na nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, and particulate matter. In the short, short term, there's asthma exacerbations, there's throat and na nasal irritation, and long term effects. So if you're exposed many, many years uh, of your life, you can have these kidney and liver, liver, liver damage and uh, central nervous system effects. Um, exposure to air pollution associated with natural gas infrastructure has already been uh, showing some specific health defects, um, such as congenital heart defects and neural tube defects in uh, Colorado, in a study in Colorado around fracking uh, wells, and low birth weight and preterm birth. So the most vulnerable populations are being affected first, which is kind of like common sense. Um, among those living within a close proximity of natural gas infrastructure, they have found in Pennsylvania already throat and nasal irritation, sinus problems, eye burning, skin rashes, severe headaches, persistent cough, um, nose bleeds. And um, so, based on those studies, the health impact, impact assessment from, from the University of Maryland concluded that they were expected to be high uh, public health impacts from air quality, just from air quality. I'm not even touching any of the, of the uh, pollutants or problems, but uh, they identified vulnerable populations because because individuals living closer to the facilities are uh, experience higher exposure than those living far away. Uh, the duration of exposure is going to be predictably long if you live in close to the, to the infrastructure. Uh, the frequency of exposure is high because it's frequent. You, you live in that community, you're going to have frequent exposure. Uh, the likelihood of health effects, as I mentioned before, is highly likely that it's going to be uh, present. And the magnitude and severity of the health are also high. And so, if this won't convince somebody that there's potential of 
of high, high potential of self effects. Uh, we don't know what to do, you know, if we can convince them well, with this uh, evidence. So, so that's all I had because I want, I want, really want you to hear from people that are living close to, the, to this uh, infrastructure. So, we'll see. That yeah, will we'll go to the next. So our next speaker is going to be uh, Margaret Flowers. Do you already have your presentation? Yeah. So it really shut them down. And so 
they did not inform the community, <coughs> neither did Dominion, of what was going to be constructed right across the street from them. Um, there were a series of hearings held, you know, the typical permit hearings, um, Maryland Department of the Environment and Public Service Commission and all that. Um, they were really, you know, uh, they were not opportunity for the public to speak, but they really weren't in any way that their feedback was not incorporated. Literally, uh, Governor O'Malley came to one of the hearings where a number of folks from Coke Point showed up to testify and waited many hours to testify. He fell asleep during their testimony and left early, so um, showed you how much he was concerned. And literally, he was paid, Dominion Energy paid him $5,000 right before he granted that permit, and then they paid another $5,000 the week after and then retracted that. I think they realized that they had already paid him off, but they forgot. You know, so I went through all the um, donations from Dominion. So the public felt, you know, the community felt really like their input was not important at all in this process. There was a really strong media bias. We started out early on with trying to uh, get letters to the editor in the local papers. And what we found was anytime Dominion sent a press release, they almost just printed it without question. Um, and Dominion kept claiming that they're so responsible and they're a good neighbor and they're doing everything so safely. And anytime we wrote a letter to the editor, we went through a very stringent process of having, you know, they question at every point and we have to say, well, here's, you know, why we said this. It was, uh, we had a lot of scrutiny that we didn't feel Dominion was getting the same scrutiny. Um, Dominion gave a lot of donations very strategically in the community. They gave donations to the schools, uh, basically for their environmental programs, because they're such a good neighbor. If you go to any library in that area, they have uh, community rooms that are Dominion Energy community rooms. Um, so they use their money very strategically to buy Goodwill from the community. Uh, and as a result, no elected official or agency that the community went to uh, from any level, from the local <laughs> level up to our members of Congress, uh, going to the state's attorney's office, Maryland Department of the Environment. Literally nobody would take responsibility for this. Uh, they would keep saying, well, that's not my area, or there's nothing I can do about it. And, um, and so again, people felt very not represented. Um, I should outline or say that when Dominion filed their permit request with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, they left out 90% of the population. So they portrayed this as a rural area with 2,000 people living 16 miles north in the Prince Frederick and about 2,000 people living 8 miles south in Solomons. And apparently there was the 40,000 people living right around the facility didn't actually exist. So, um, so that was really interesting uh, as an experience. Um, so people in the community really literally did everything that they could think of to try and stop this. Uh, they were out petitioning um, in the you know, shopping centers, door-to-door -door canvassing, haggling at community events, uh, testifying at any hearings we could testify at. There was an excellent march that we did one year, a six-mile march from where they dropped off the heavy loads and trucked them up to the facility uh, to construct it. Uh, they, they did actions to try to shut down the construction. Um, did a lot of work connecting this to upstream campaigns, the fracking and pipelines that were being put in elsewhere, trying to make the point that this is the first export terminal on the East Coast, that the price of gas abroad is three to four times what the domestic price is. And so by allowing an export terminal to go through, we're literally driving throughout the region and, um, and more infrastructure that, that goes with that. So we really saw this as a key fight for the, for the East Coast. Um, we tried to do a divestment campaign, uh, very creative actions against Bank of America, one of their major funders um, at, one of the, at the Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte, North Carolina during one of the Panthers games. The, there was a major banner drop that got a lot of attention. It was Monday Night Football and some folks got in and dropped a main um, huge banner from one of the upper levels right in front of the media. It was beautifully done and raised a lot of awareness. And going to financial meetings, going to the Dominion Energy shareholders meetings, uh, 
we went to Dominion was holding a meeting to meet with potential investors at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, and we had about four waves of attempt to crash that <laughs> meeting and impact them uh, to try and let the investors know that this was not a good investment, that it's going to be stranded assets, that it's going to be have impacts on the global community, and that the community doesn't want it. Um, so, and then we did uh, Kai activism as well, you know, going to meetings where the governor was, uh, going to where there were high populations of people with the kayaks, with the banners and messaging, things like that as well. Um, and then in the bottom right-hand corner um, is on Lawyers Mall in Annapolis. So we petitioned, you know, this was done under Governor O'Malley, uh, but then Governor Hogan came in, and there was never a quantitative risk assessment done. There was no safety study done. And we believe that that was not done because it would have shown that this shouldn't be where it is. So we started petitioning, and there's the petition went around that you signed it. We're still petitioning. The governor, we found that he could pick up the phone literally and call the Department of Natural Resources and use his executive authority to order quantitative risk assessment. And so we started petitioning, meeting with his staff uh, to try to get him to order that safety study. And in June of last year, he finally issued a response and said, no, I support the project, and I'm not ordering a safety study. He said, well, we think you can support the project and still order a safety study, so that doesn't really make sense to us. And we began the next week doing rallies outside of this mansion and outside the state house. And those have been going on <coughs> consecutively since then. I think this week is our 46th or 47th week uh, being out there. Um, likewise, we, the PSC, the Public Service Commission, Dominion either lied to the state or just was very incompetent. when they first got their permit from the Public Service Commission. And then last August, as they were nearing completion of the project, they said, oops, it's actually over 160,000 components that are going to be potentially leaking. And so that limit that you gave us on how much methane we can leak, we can't do that. So can you just take <coughs> that limit away? And we said, surely the PSC is not going to do that. And people protested, and hundreds of public comments went in. And the PSC said, yes, we will take away uh, those limits. What was to me very disheartening, you know, we expected Dominion to go in there and to kind of, you know, mislead the Public Service Commission, but the Maryland Department of the Environment's representative sounded like he worked for Dominion. He went in and said, we never should have put limits on in the first place. That was our mistake. Um, we don't know what we're really doing. This is all new. We've never had one of these before, as if they don't exist anywhere else, and he doesn't actually know how to travel there. But, you know, he said that we're like a baby learning to crawl. We're just feeling our way out. Um, the, the facility did open in March of this year and it started taking its first shipments of gas that are being exported to Japan and India. Um, so when we look at this, you know, we didn't stop the facility. Um, it was significantly slowed down for whatever reasons. I hope that we contributed to that in some part. Um, and, you know, folks in Cove Point and allies from around the straight state did, you know, help in some way to, to make connections with other fights around the state and our surrounding neighboring states and to strengthen that network of activists fighting gas infrastructure. The big obstacles have been that the Maryland administration thinks gas is a good thing. You know, Hogan just signed uh, an agreement saying he wants $100 million more of gas infrastructure built in the states of Maryland. Uh, this is, was only one year and
members of the SWAT team in the Sheriff's Department. Uh, they have a memorandum of understanding with the Sheriff's Department that if they need anything, equipment, travel, training, that they will receive it. So they, they bought, uh, they bought um, speed boats with machine guns for them. And, um, and the court system is also not friendly in that community. So people who did what would be a simple trespass, and in most places, you know, be a very minimal kind of consequences for that. Uh, some people ended up serving time in jail. Um, the rest of us got 20 day suspended sentences and a three year probation, which was the time that they expected to would take to finish building the facility. So making it, that made it hard to be able to keep a nonviolent uh, campaign going, a direct action campaign going. And then I think I have 20 seconds left. Uh, next steps, um, we're still pushing for that quantitative risk assessment. Uh, we're pressing for air monitoring. So they don't, they're literally not monitoring what's coming out of this. The more than 20 tons of pollutants that will come out every year. Um, they are, they have, they say they're monitoring the leaks, but not, it's, they're looking for leaks. They're not actually looking at the quantity of the stuff that are coming out or what is coming out. Um, and then other than that, they have a monitor at the smokestack. And then I think the nearest air monitor is many miles away on top of a hill, like, um, would not even, you know, pick up what was going on really at this facility. So we've been meeting with Maryland Department of the Environment and saying, you know, you need to at least be telling folks in the community what they're being exposed to. Um, using the frack tracker, trying to encourage people in the community to document the impacts of this facility, because we're not going to stop fighting it. You know, it's not like you put this giant thing in the neighborhood and then we can go away, right? It's, it's still there. We have to try to shut it down. Uh, joining fights for associated gas infrastructure, which Kelly's going to talk a little bit about. And then just the bigger picture is we need to stop fossil fuels in the state of Maryland and do 20% clean renewable energy. So I'll stop there. Okay, and our third, third and last speaker is uh, Kelly Canavan, who is uh, president. Acronym or just that's the. It is the uh, Akik Madawoman Piscataway Creeks Communities Council, which I recognize oh, wow. is a very silly long name, but <laughs> we have that for uh, legal reasons. That when the the group was formed, we um, we were formed out of a settlement. Oh, I turned it off silly. We were formed out of a settlement, and uh, we had to name our group in a way that would let us do the things we wanted to do. Uh, uh huh. It's the Akakee Madawoman Scataway Creeks Communities Council. Okay. Um, so my name is Kelly Canavan. Uh, I live in Akakee, about a mile and a half from Dominion's proposed Charles Station Compressor Station site. And um, I really am just sort of the next step from Margaret's presentation because, of course, she was focusing on the export terminal in Cove Point in Calvert County, Maryland. That is at the end of an 88-mile long pipeline, the Dominion Cove Point pipeline. And, um, and if you back up that pipeline, there is now a, a compressor station. There are several compressors. There's a compressor station that is proposed to be built in Charles County where I live, one in Loudoun County that is um, now being expanded, and then one in Pleasant Valley that is being uh, retooled, upgraded. Um, and then further up the, up the line past that pipeline, there are, of course, the feeding pipelines into it. So in an effort to, uh, to choke off the Cove Point Export Terminal, we are continuing to fight these other pieces of infrastructure. So for example, Amp Creeks is involved in a lawsuit um, that is trying to stop the Atlantic Sunrise Pipeline, which runs, uh, well, would run north to south um, through Pennsylvania if 
uh, construction is complete on that, and it would be the largest feeder pipeline to this export terminal. So, um, just to give you a little bit of a quick background, Amp Creeks is a, a very tiny kitchen table nonprofit organization. Um, we do uh, land use and zoning work primarily uh, in an attempt to uh, create happier lives for as many people as possible. Um, and we, we do a lot of different kinds of things, but for much of the last five years, we have been fighting the Cove Point Export Terminal and um, now Charles Station. And so we've done that in a couple of ways. One way is in the courtroom and in hearings. This is um, one of our lawyers. Uh, coincidentally, that one's my brother. Um, but he's a fantastic lawyer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so this is at the court of um, the Court of Appeals, which is like the Maryland Supreme Court. And this is us fighting um, the Maryland Public Service Commission's decision to permit uh, a power plant that only runs the Cove Point Export Terminal and nothing else at all. Um, and then there's the direct action approach as well. And I know that you already saw that picture, but this is um, us in Cove Point. And then here we are during the hearing process Charles Station. That is another of our lawyers on the far side. Carol Holden, who's fantastic, um, and one of our uh, one of our opponents testifying there. And then again, uh, with the direct action, this is us at the site um, where construction is proposed and um, uh, us attempting to stop the felling of trees there. So. Charles Station is currently the subject of an air quality and uh, an air quality permitting process at the MDE and a dewatering permitting process at the MDE, which will be followed if that is granted by a discharge, uh, a water discharge process, also at the MDE. It is also the subject of a special uh, exception zoning process in Charles County and a federal lawsuit that is focusing on preemption, whether or not FERC can just yank the other permits out from under um, the county and, uh, and then would sort of cause a collapsing domino effect for us. So we actually um, had victories in, in both of these fights. In the Cove Point Export Terminal fight, we had some pretty exciting legal victories early on. One of them, um, Margaret mentioned, had to do with the PIA, uh, sorry, with the uh, non-disclosure agreement. We did a PIA request that uh, discovered the non-disclosure agreement, and then we uh, went to court on that um, over uh, trying to gain documentation and figure out what was going on. And we had a partial victory there. We had a big victory on zoning with the Cove Point Export Terminal early on. And in the uh, Charles Station fight, the Compressor Station fight, we won at the county level. So the zoning for this project was denied. And that's huge, because in theory, the Maryland Department of the Environment should not be allowed to move forward with the process of, of uh, granting an air quality permit or even considering it, or a dewatering permit because the zoning is not in place that's part of the Maryland Code. Um, however, they are moving forward, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, one thing that we have found is that organizing against this compressor station is painfully reminiscent of organizing against the export terminal um, in a couple of ways. One is that the residents in, uh, in both areas are obviously faced with frightening pieces of LNG infrastructure. Um, they have had to become experts overnight on the ins and outs of the trafficking of fracked gas, which is something that nobody wants to know anything about, um, and are facing the threat of the infrastructure and dealing with the mental health impacts and um, fractured communities that come with this stuff. And so. This picture is um, sort of a happy, sad picture. This is from an event that we organized um, in Akiki for people in the surrounding area to come together. We, we called it the spaghetti out of here dinner. And so we had a spaghetti dinner and, um, and invited people to come together and we brought in like a 
laptops and tablets and stuff like that and set people up so that they could send comments to FERC, um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission opposing the project. We had really good turnout and, uh, and we got a lot in. That's my son helping this gentleman um, because he doesn't know how to how to send the comments. So that was him going around doing that. And we had this wandering minstrel accordion player, which is lots of fun. Um, however, um, our community is at great risk, and we are feeling the weight of that um, profoundly. And you heard, of course, in Dr. Rule's presentation about uh, all of the health impacts that come with natural gas infrastructure projects, but if I can just give you a microcosm of that. If you just take the Amp Creek's board and uh, co-opponents in the legal actions that we're working on for Charles Station, just within that group of people, we all live within five miles of the site and one of us is only one property removed from it. Uh, two, rather. Two are only one property removed from it. We're from a variety of racial and ethnic backgrounds. We have children ranging from 18 months to 42 years old. Many of us live with chronic illnesses. Three have or have had cancer. We range from 15 to nearly 70 years old. Most of us grow and eat some of our own food. Um, many of us have animals who live uh, both in and out of doors. Two of us live on small farms. Many of us live on land that is in preservation. Two of us built our own houses. Several are part of multi-generational families who live in this area. All of us thought we were living in our forever homes. Some of us would not have bought here if we'd known about the compressor station. And at this point, several of us are considering moving because of it, if it is built. So the fear, and, and just to give you that overview, the, the reason I'm giving you all of those, you know, the whole long list is to point out that just in this little group of people, we are at risk. We fall into those at-risk categories in so many ways. And, and if you look at the larger community and how many people will be affected, sort of like, will only the strong among us survive? Who gets through this without the cancer? You know, which of us doesn't get the headaches and the nosebleeds and the, and the rotten effects? And it, it's a painful and scary thing to think about. The fear of that is driving stress, anxiety, and other problems in our community. We are justifiably terrified of the compressor station, the threats of the toxic and carcinogenic emissions, and the possibility of catastrophic events. So this is a fire that happened um, on the day that uh, uh, FERC comments, the first round of FERC comments were due. Um, so under the current threat of fresh fires in the area, people are getting really nervous because every time someone mentions fire at this point, all we're thinking of is what happens if it happens at the compressor station. If that thing is built and a fire occurs there. Just during the special exception zoning hearing process, um, four uh, homes or, or major outbuildings have burned to the ground within two miles of the site and five within the last two years. A man and his dog were killed just a half mile to the site and in all cases it was because water could not get to the fires. So um, here's another one of the houses that, that burned to the ground uh, completely. Uh, On the morning of one of our hearings, uh, there, it was a seven hearing process, it went on for quite a long time. Um, on the mornings of one of our hearings, there was an explosion at an Austrian compressor station, a fairly new compressor station, so this wasn't like something that was old and dusty, it was state of the art, um, it exploded, uh, 24 people were injured, there was a death. People are frightened of terrorism, the site is easily accessible, and frequently trespassed hunters, people on just people wandering through the woods are there all the time. Um, the topography is inverted. It's sort of a fishbowl. This is after a heavy rain. This happens all the time. So the roads flood. Uh, they're very narrow. Fire trucks can't get by in both directions. Um, and of course, we're worried about uh, air pollution. So that would be coming, for example, from blowdowns from 
startups and shutdowns of the plant and blowdowns um, to release uh, gas into the air uh, in case of an emergency or a problem. Dominion estimates that there will be 100 planned blowdowns per year. So um, you can imagine how terrifying that is to us. In, in Calvert County, folks are worried about bomb ships. Uh, every time a tanker comes into port, you see people who are still living there start posting and posting and posting like every hour. Things are going up on Facebook. Now the ship is here, now the ship is here, now the ship is here, because they're just scared. They're so frightened of what could happen if something goes wrong. They were actually told that they are living in a sacrifice zone. Those are the words that were used, a sacrifice zone. How would you like to know that that is what your life is? The mental stress that that puts on you is impossible to escape from. So figuring out how to deal with this both brings us together and drives us apart. It has led to a lot of community infighting, people trying to figure out how to deal with these things, how to fight them, how to uh, live with them or not live with them. Um, and just some community dissolution. So this, this picture is a really awful one. This is one of the local fire departments that would serve this site and which would serve my home. Um, and you can see they're sort of closing with their fire truck smiling, right? This is immediately following the death of the man um, in the fire a half mile from the Dominion site. This is that morning. They just finished putting out the fire and gathered for a happy face picture there. This fire department did not come to the Board of Appeals hearings, even though we subpoenaed them twice. They would not talk to us. Having to even serve the subpoenas to those firefighters involved a ridiculous amount of chasing them around and being sneaky about it because they would not talk to us. That should never happen. This is an all volunteer fire department. I know that chief. I've known him since I was this big. I know his sister. We grew up together. And at this point, there's no talking. And that's happening throughout the community. There's all sorts of, there are these weird divisions that are happening. And it leads to paranoia, you know, is Dominion paying them off? Did Dominion promise to buy them something? Why won't they speak to us? Why are they not showing up at hearings? Just in my own experience, I know seven families who moved away from Cove Point because of the export terminal. Those are only people who I know and have worked with. I already am aware of uh, one family, the first family so far, who has moved away from Akiki because of the fear of the compressor station. So this is happening already, right now. And it leads to the question of sort of health versus healthy finances. Who moves into an NGI neighborhood? Who moves into a neighborhood where this stuff exists, right? Because real estate agents are required to, um, to, to explain, to disclose that it's there. And if they do their job, no one's gonna want to move into these neighborhoods. At the same time, People who are moving out of the neighborhoods are only the people who have the means to do so. A lot of people don't have that opportunity. And so what happens is this creation of communities of people who are already marginalized and are now further marginalized and further disproportionately affected by these pieces of infrastructure. So, and I know you saw a slide of this earlier also. This is at um, a PSC hearing um, where we were fighting, uh, and Margaret explained that, so I won't go into it. But real quickly, um, permitting and trust issues arise from this. So the interests of the company we have found are absolutely always prioritized over the interests of people and the environment. We, are, we have found that corporations are allowed to lie, they are allowed to manipulate data and information, and apparently with no trouble at all our government and public officials. Um, in Cove Point, um, and Margaret covered some of this, for, at the FERC level, they, they lied about census data. At the PSC, the number of leaking components. At the Charles County, I'm sorry, at the Calvert County level, the non-disclosure agreement. In Charles County, um, about emergency preparedness, about zoning information, documents were withheld by county staff in our PIA requests. We get into this situation where we feel like politicians and agencies betray us and it creates cognitive dissonance for people who have been raised to trust them. It's disorienting and it breeds mistrust among others. 
We know that they should be protecting us, but instead are working behind the scenes to ensure smooth sailing for these corporations. We are being dragged down by the riptide that is LNG. LNG is not a bridge. It is pulling us under. So what should we do? And I'm going to wrap up here. Health and safety must be at the forefront of monitoring and reviewing processes for existing natural gas infrastructure. Psychosocial stress and mental health considerations must be considered as part of every health assessment conducted on existing infrastructure and in no further applications for natural gas infrastructure must be, uh, must be accepted. There needs to be a moratorium on fracked gas infrastructure altogether. Folks hear that and they think that's so radical, that that's not possible, we can't do a thing like that. It's not too radical at all. It is a life change like any other. It is like a dietary change. It is like having a baby on a larger scale. We will find that the benefits far outweigh the risks. Thank you so much for your time. Comment in regard to the letter of Zunza. I live down near Cove Point. I have a comment uh, in regard to your presentation to Dr. Flowers and a question for you, Dr. Wolf. Uh, my comment for you, Margaret, is that uh, I agree totally with your presentation. I will quibble with one small thing. It was only federal and state officials who denied any responsibility or knowledge of the details. Calvert County commissioners, including the commissioner who negotiated the deal with the gave away a half a billion dollars in tax revenue, bragged about it, thought it was a great deal. Voters realized otherwise, and they voted in the <coughs> office, uh, but that's very small. Uh, Dr. Rolf, you're about the health impact assessment. Uh, who does that, and most importantly, how much does it cost? So that if we want to see the health impact assessment at Coke Point, uh, could even the community finance it if the cost was reasonable? So who does that? Um, I think actually. Who did it? Uh, that's the party like, team. That, we know who did it. But is, who it else was, could, it was, could it was, do it? It was financed by um, uh, MBE yeah. and the Department of Health. And so. It was financed by the Department of Health. Department of Health. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the Department of Health. So. The amount of money for it was, and I would call it a rapid HIA. That was actually one of the worst experiences I've ever had in my life, working as HIA. Because of the politics of it, because of the, the fact that the HIA was done after the uh, environmental assessment was done. So they already had, a, they already had the plan they're going to do fracking. And so we were supposed to do a health, so the health, the HIA comes first to inform stuff. There's a no, oh, we got to do HIA now. Let's check this box. So I felt very uncomfortable doing the HIA. Because you're supposed to, you know, have this from a fresh slate. We didn't have that, so it was almost like we were being pushed to come to this. We were. It was even. And I, I, it was even part of the process where I felt that, that we couldn't say that no to fracking. Politically, we were. So it was actually the HIA, in my opinion, was being steered a certain way. If I was able to do it the way I wanted to do it, we would have had a fresh slate, done the HIA, and would say no. If you do do it, then this. But we barely get in the know, right? But it costs over a hundred thousand dollars or so, based on the the, the money that we receive and plus the amount of in kind. It wasn't funded the way it should have been funded, and we actually wouldn't have the time to do it the way we wanted to do it because the scoping was cut short. We wanted to do a, a health survey. We didn't have the time to do that. We wanted to do some air pollution monitoring. We wouldn't have the time to do that. So what we, a lot of things we want to do, we couldn't do. So that's why I call it more a limited, it's more of a limited HIA. It wasn't, it wasn't robust as comprehensively as we wanted it. And, but I think we were able to still get a good product out. It was a lot of political, I don't talk too much, it was a lot of political pressure during that process that I think had a negative impact on our ability to really communicate and engage the impact of state, the state culture concern. So the other thing I was going to say pretty quickly is uh, there's there's different levels and, and, and Dr. Wilson kind of alluded into it. You can do a full-blown yes. comprehensive health impact system that could take many years or should take actually. You know, it should usually, take so. Right, it should take many years. 
but you can also do a, a, a faster health risk assessment and um, it's called a rapid a rapid HIA. Rapid HIA. Yeah. And there's uh, people here at the University of Maryland and, and there's at least one investigator at Hopkins that specializes in that. And she has her students do rapid risk assessments, which at least inform the community where to go and could could if, if you if your endpoint is to know what what it, it would cost and who would fund it. Could give you that information. Man, we, we've done rapid HIAs for the chicken waste incineration, the, the, the energy answer incinerator. With Maria Pins, we all met Maria, we did an HIA with Chicken Processor Plant in Delaware. So we, we've done a lot of HIAs. Many of them, it's a student who we mentor who does it for a semester, which makes it rapid in its nature because it's part of their project. And more accessible also. Yeah. So that's, so that's one way. It, it seems, if I could just comment that, um, shouldn't we be able to look at health utilization, look at, couldn't we get the records, you know, this is a, a community yeah. with not a lot of health centers, you know, one major ER, looking at the utilization in, in we, years we, before. And so we looked, the the ER we looked at healthcare infrastructure, it's yeah. part of the HIA. But the, the, for Coke Point, so, we should be able to do that Yeah, we can, do the, we, can do the same, we can do the same thing yeah. with Coke Point. Look, if it's a health, if it's a medical underserved area, if it's a health professional shortage area, yeah. look at health status data, we can get that data now, and that could be something that's, that's easily done. Right, yeah. I'm looking at the first year online. Yeah. Yeah. Other, I'm sorry, other questions? Yes. Um, from your experiences engaging with regulators, um, both state and at the local level, where have you found that you've gotten any kind of positive response? I mean, you probably were mentioning the special um, zoning exception hearing that kind of went your way. Are there any other kind of um, uh, entry points where you found that you got some kind of leverage? Either one of you. And, and also why? What, why do you think they were motivated? Frankly, no. I want to be more encouraging that than that, but no, because at you know Dominion is really thorough. They're obviously a juggernaut corporation. They're really thorough in, in donating wherever donations need to be sprinkled around, and they make sure that the right strings are pulled. You know, they're really, really good at that stuff. Uh, in fact, when they when they came into the the Board of uh, Appeals Zone Special Exception Hearing, they were extremely cocky. You know, like they, they came in there knowing they were gonna get what they wanted, and it kind of tripped them up, and, and the Board of Appeals is not an elected body. Um, so they are in a slightly different situation, and I think that is a, a big part of what helped us. Um, but they also fired the lawyer who lost that, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, I mean, th there's an ideology. You know, the Tad Aburn, who's the head of air quality at MPE, he thinks gas is great. And it, and there's also this kind of... Um, he's worried about trees. Well, yeah. I mean, he said well, some of the most ridiculous the things in the meetings that we had, that 80% of our VOCs come from trees. And, you know, and, and things like, oh, well, maybe we can get some money to put a medical clinic in down there. And, you know, I, so I said, really, really, you want, it's okay to pollute this community, but maybe we'll give them a medical clinic for people who can't afford care. So, you know, it's just, this is the way that they do things. They're not used to being challenged, you know. So they don't have a way to respond to that. And Brian, Brian Frosch's office was happy to sue Dominion about coal ash dumping in Virginia, but when we brought the information to him that Dominion lied on its permits, uh, nothing. Radio silence and nothing on Charles Station. I should have meant that to say the one place they found help is in the court system. So the court system is the only place in my experience that we have found that we decided to be on the um, Just a comment. As many people here know, um, the Maryland Environmental Health Network and the Sierra Club and others supported um, a law in the legislature which failed uh, early in the session to require health impact assessments. Um, I think it will be an uphill battle, but if that may come back again as a bill next year. Yeah, that's an opportunity. Let me go to the back in a couple minutes. Um, thank you for, for the two of you who are fighting on the local level. Really appreciate it. Um, I have a question, uh, sort of a, a bigger picture question. You know, if you succeed in stopping the Charles Station from being built, maybe that's first, and then maybe even if, if Cove Point can be closed down, how does that, well, first Charles Charles Station, it's not built. How does that affect the flow of fracked gas and the fracking itself and sort of the 
the, the, infrastructure, the uh, fossil fuel infrastructure development in this region if you were to not have that state? We think it's a real choke point, and that's one of the reasons it's such an important fight, is that for one thing, it's not out of reach to win this fight. Um, but it's a real choke point because the rationale that Dominion gave for um, needing this compressor station, uh, they said they said the gas is going to go to these two customers, okay? But there is already capacity in the pipeline to get the gas to those customers. They don't need the additional compression at all. However, Dominion has said that they want to, um, and Len was just talking about this, add a second drive train at the liquefaction, a, a separate, second liquefaction train in Cove Point. Um, if they can't get the gas they need there, it really causes a problem for them. They're already having trouble getting gas because the Atlantic Sunrise Pipeline has not been finished, and they're having to like uh, uh, siphon gas off from other places in markets and you know, spurts. So it's, it's sort of a death by a thousand paper cuts. If we can choke that part out, then we protect the immediate community in, in, you know, around the station, but also hopefully um, in Calvary County and further north in Pennsylvania, because there may not be so much of a demand. You know, the, the market also changes so quickly for fracked gas, uh, the, the need for it. When, uh, when the pipeline was originally built, it was for import, and it, it was not very long ago that it was still you know, intended for import and then for storage. It's just kind of been going back and forth. Dominion just sort of built it in there, just trying to find something to do with it. You know, I, I really don't have confidence that this is going to last very long just because of the market. And then could Cove Point be, be closed down? Well, you know, if, if we get a responsive government, yeah, maybe it could be closed down. But literally, the fracking was starting to fall off in Pennsylvania. And this is just, this is going to drive more fracking so, so we got three minutes. I want to do rapid questions and response. So yes, sir. Uh, okay, I'll try to make it rapid. Uh, it sounds like a real linchpin of a lot of these. The natural gas build out in Maryland is the conclusion that it's consistent with the greenhouse gas reduction goals that are required by law. Um, uh, is I, I'd love to hear what's happening to try to take that conclusion on directly and refute it. Um, what what are the ongoing efforts on that? Yeah, I haven't been able to get good answers. I've been asking for you know over a year to the MDE, how does this fit in? Because they look at it as export, so they don't see it as really impacting Maryland because it's going to be burned in Japan. So they just don't count it. And and the and the gas guys are telling them that this is such a boom. This is you know another economy of economic boost to the state of Maryland. But you, we just had that that meeting. We at least got the, the word out that is, there's other things that they need to consider that, that is, we're not going to give them the pass. But they, get, they know it. Okay, I'm going to go here and then here and then. You still got it, Mike? I'm going to close it down. Just stay in. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, Chris. Is, is this subject to the to TRI reporting, toxic release, inventory reporting? It should. <laughs> yeah. Is it well? Yeah. And, and, and because then that would, I would think it would force measurable, measure, you know, measurements they of release. Yeah. And I'm going to say it should, but we have found time and time again that for some reason the media gets away with it. So maybe, maybe it's a they should, enforcement issue. It's an enforcement like, issue. And if that's possible, and if that's possible, then would that? MD has refused to put monitors up because they said they don't have the money for them. It's actually more explicit than that. They are not putting up monitors close to point sources of pollution because they want to monitor area wide. Area. And in the environmental assessment that FERC did, they waxed eloquently that uh, a park in Virginia that was some 50, 60 miles away from Cove Point would not be affected by Cove Point, but they said nothing about community. Of course it wouldn't be. Okay, let's, <laughs> let me not talk. Okay. <laughs> okay. Kelly, what, to what degree are uh, county council and uh, like elected official state delegates complicit in this, and what can we do yeah. to, Voting. like, right I'm now? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> so glad. 
I didn't, but I should have. Yeah. Way too complicit. So um, folks have been reaching out to elected officials, and there are a lot of them. And through various conversations, uh, some of them like this, we have found that there are a couple of officials in particular who really need to be getting phone calls and, um, and be getting hammered on this stuff. If, for example, one was to stop by the tables downstairs, um, you would find that Amcrix has a table with contact information and scripts and all sorts of action items that you can do to help us with this, including talking to uh, elected officials. Uh, but is that a G G -E 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 which ones? I mean, yeah. Frank with it. I mean, who, what, who's complicit that we need to like vote out now? We got one month. Logan, Frosch, Mac Middleton, the county commissioners are being sued right now. They Mike need Miller. to Mike Miller. The county commissioners are being sued right now. They need to know that um, that that we are watching them and insist that they support the board of appeals to defend the hearing, to defend their decision rather. Defending that decision is a really big deal. Um, and then peripherally, just anybody else who we can get on a, on a local or state level to write letters to the MDE. That is the really big ask right now, is contact the MDE and tell them no. Or to tell about the MDE protests that are going on. Well, so the, we have a, if you go to the wearecoatpoint.org website, sign up there, you'll get on our email list. We have information there about how to submit a public comment. Um, it, the period's going on to June 12th. Um, and then every Wednesday, we're doing what we call drop-in and hang-out at the Maryland Department of the Environment. Um, we've done it for three weeks now, and it really irks them, but it's pretty clear that they're not interested in arresting us, um, so we feel pretty licensed to do whatever we want to, want to do in that space. So uh, you can sign up and join us for those. They become a weekly teaching because they won't arrest us We do a teaching. We do a, a, and so a we do a live, teaching. and people can watch for it and share it widely, and Governor Hogan needs to be held responsible. $100 million in frack gas infrastructure, and he's the good guy running for governor? Yeah. yeah. He needs yeah. to be exposed. He does. Need to, um, so, so last question. Hi, go ahead. Um, so the power plants that are going in, Brandywine and Waldorf, how are they connected to the compressor of the pipelines in which direction? And another question for Clark is um, peak natural gas. Um, how much do you think that's actually happening? And if all this stuff gets filled, like, we only have five years of cheap gas left anyway. So in terms of the power plants, um, so there are, uh, the Waldorf ones are not specifically relevant to this, although they do feed off that pipeline, they're not named in this project. The proposed Mad Woman Energy Center, which would be in Brandywine and causing a gigantic environmental justice problem, um, well, really just compounding it. Um, uh, is on really iffy footing. It hasn't received all of its permits. It is the subject of legal actions based on the environmental justice, as you know, environmental justice um, uh, infractions. And also it's been listed on PJM for like a year now as suspended. So no one really knows what's going on with them. They don't even have funding for that, for that uh, power plant. We don't have confidence, fortunately, that it will be built. I'm hopeful that it won't be built. Um, so <coughs> The other two plants that are brand new ones, I guess, coming up through that compressor to that. I'm sorry, say again? The Pandem, Pandem Matter one, right? Well, the keys is the one that is built there. Plus, there's a small gas plant already in brand new one. So, you know, we've got right. a third or so, too. So, how's the gas getting to that? It's, it feeds off of that pipeline. It's just not named in the specific project. So, it still feeds off of them. But the capacity is already there in the pipeline for them to get the gas, except for the Matter one. I mean, it really is, but they're pretending it's not. So is the compressor station, uh, are those facilities the proposed power plants before the proposed compressor station or after? The other power plants are before it. The Bata Woman is after it. Okay. Uh, well, I don't want to shut down the conversation, but I got to get y'all to lunch. <laughs> so let's thank our panelists.